Um, please give a warm hand to Laura Lau and Chris Kentis. Here they come, as promised. Have a seat and grab a mic. So, uh, your last movie was kind of set out in the open, uh, in the middle of the ocean, very open space. So, you kind of like sat down and said, the next one I think we should just be completely shut up indoors. Was that the plan? You know, it's, it, it's funny because no, it's, it's, it's not. We didn't have a lot of choice in this one. Um, you want to? You well, step you know, in? I think it's interesting because I think that both movies are really kind of claustrophobic. It's like in open water, you're with two people, even though they're in a vast ocean, you're just with them, and there's something about just staying with them. It's very, it's very intimate, and I think here it's the same kind of a thing where you're with a character, and of course, with the continuous shot, you can't get away from her. And it's really important that we like her because we're going to be stuck with her for 80 minutes. Yes, yes. You have to, you have to really care about her and want to watch her because the whole film is about her experience of reality. The film is literally her experience of reality. So, so the challenge of casting this is to have somebody the, the, that we can, that can sustain that kind of um, scrutiny for that length of time. Um, you see who you arrived at but was that was that an arduous process to find someone that could could carry this and and um <clears throat> but maintain the various levels of kind of emotional kind of uh, reaction the ups and downs of that and also be kind of easy on the eye and, and, and charismatic in some way or have some kind of screen presence well we have to say that um we have casting directors that we had been working with before carrie barton and paul Schnee. Cast uh, Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone the year before, and they we gave them the script, and immediately they said, "We know who Sarah has to be," and they had Lizzie in mind, and so we actually saw Lizzie early on in the audition process, and she was fantastic, and she really set the bar. But we did go through the process, and we did meet with a lot of other actors, and there were other reasons why Lizzie was really um, we felt perfect for the role she had. We were looking for somebody who had theater experience because we knew that the single you know, the shot was, it was not easy shooting the film, and we knew that we needed an actress who had training in theater so that she could keep her focus and keep her concentration and keep her performance at a high level for a long period of time. And, and Lizzie had those skills. She had gone to Russia and studied theater. She's a very serious actress, really takes her craft seriously. I, I started out in film as an editor, and and that's what excited me about film because it's one of the, the unique aspects about film as opposed to any other art form, editing. And, and here we took on a film where that has been eliminated. It's, it's, it's gone. And sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, can talk, we can talk about that more. But, but as far as crafting a performance, and I, I could say okay, that, you know, yeah. even if you have the, the greatest actor in the world, the worst actor, it's like so often it's... An, falls in the hands of the editor to create a performance. And here you have a film where that, that's been taken away, and you really need somebody who's going to carry this through these long, long takes and carry the emotion and, and, and also all the technical difficulties of that particular take. And uh, she did an extraordinary job. You really need someone who could, you could count on to do that, and she, she came through. Um. I remember um, John Sayles talking about when he made City of Hope, which is like, I think, like 10 shots, like 10, like, uh, or, or 20 shots, like each, he used like, he, he did it in 10 minute takes, one after the other. So it was really easy to edit at the end, he just put them together and the film was done. But he said the, um, <laughs> the, the, the nightmare of doing that was that if someone botched something nine minutes into the take, you have to, you know, it's all, it's all for naught, and you have to go back and do it again. Did you find, did, did you kind of rehearse intensively? Um, or uh, if so, for how long? And were there any kind of um, particular problems or stumbling blocks that, that meant that doing a particular stretch of the film, something would go wrong just, just, just before you, 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 you nailed that, that passage? 
Absolutely. We had two weeks of rehearsal and we had three weeks to shoot the film. And, um, you know, th the takes were very, very long. Some of our takes were more than 13 minutes. And um, it required so many people to hit all of their cues. And, you know, the whole house was pre-lit from above and we had a, a dimmer board operator who was operating the lights. Then, of course, we had props, and, and we moved the camera a lot. We would go from outside to inside. We would go from the first floor to the third floor, from the first floor to the basement to outside without cutting. And that was very challenging. Um, and it would happen, of course it would happen, that um, somebody would just blow it at the end of a take. Sometimes it was just a prop guy just missed the moment. Somebody just didn't open the trunk in the right time. Somebody just wasn't in their spot at the right time. And uh, it happened a lot, and we, we never got a single shot before we were in the teens. Um, so, there are some hidden cards in this movie. I think the, the only one I'm certain of is when she exits the house for the first time in, through the storm doors. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a card hidden oh, in there. you mean in the, in the basement? Out of the yeah, basement for out of the basement. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly that, and, and it looked like there was one actually when she was running around outside. Uh, yeah. but no, that, actually not. That yeah. could just be my imagination. Only, only, I'll only point that out because once she gets outside in the whole, uh, the choreography of her in the car and getting out of the car and going back into the house was so difficult. <laughs> So, uh, no, there was no that cut was at that That was actually really, really cool. What, what happened was we had two camera operators. So we had one camera operator running with the camera. And what happened was he passed the cameras through the window to another operator who was in the car. And then he actually held on to the back of the car as the car drove. So we went to the house. And what happened was um, when Peter got out of the car and went um, and opened the trunk, Let's see, Ludo got into the car through the... Oh, well, he, got, he got into the driver's seat, that's right. So what happened was he got out, and so when, when Peter got out, he got into the car. And then when he opened the trunk, Igor got out. That's what it was. In, the, in other Igor words, we had two the camera, camera operators. Right. And so then when Lizzie got out, then he passed the camera to Igor, who was outside, and he ran with her in. So there was no cutting. It was, we it was actually very complicated choreography. That's, did, that's what happened. Did you ever, like, think at any point in the process of developing this that you could do it all in one take? Well, we knew with the camera that we had, which we needed a small camera in order to be able to, for the cameraman to even be able to hold it for that long. And with the camera that we chose to use, there was limitations on how long you could shoot with that camera. So we, we it was never a consideration well, to shoot the whole film in one take. Mainly it wasn't a consideration because who cares? I mean, it, I mean, the point was the experience. People come to see a movie, they don't really, Give a damn about you know, you know, look, you know, is Gollum CGI or is Gollum real? You know, who cares? I mean, the point is the experience they get to have when they come and they see the movie. And what was so intriguing about when, when someone approached us about making this film and the idea of, of making a film in one take is it's a new way of experiencing something, a new way of telling a story. And so how we achieved it? Yes, we did many, many shots, but. What the real challenge, the daunting challenge that frightened me, you know, both of us when we, we took this on, is, is the fact that all, all the usual tools you have as a filmmaker have been taken away. Yeah, it's kind of old school. There's no digital effects in this, right? Well, it's not just digital effects. It's that no when, 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 you, no when, when you want to, the, the normal way to control pacing, the normal way to control revealing information, the normal way as I was just saying earlier about even, even tweaking a performance from, of an actor, that's gone, it's off the table. So what you see is what you get. I mean, in, in, in being an editor, this is, you know, I was hyper aware of this. And so you're really just going out and you're taking a camera and you're taking you know, talent and you're taking everyone, all the creative people involved and you have to kind of nail it in one shot and in what, and you can't fix it in the cutting room, and that's a very unusual kind of challenge to have today. Who was more tired at the end of a working day, the cameraman or the actress? I think it was pretty even, but I think Lizzie was actually more tired. I think because Lizzie had to bring herself to a, a really high emotional place, you know, because the character is really complex, and um, she's really hurt, and she's really deeply traumatized, and she doesn't understand what's going on. 
And so Lizzie was bringing all of that to her performance. And I think that you know, she was bringing it every take because we didn't know what take would work. And um, it was so technically difficult. And you know, she had not only to remember her performance, but she had a lot of, of she had to remember all her cues. It was her movements that justified the camera's movements. And she also had to sometimes help with the lighting. Sometimes she would have to pick up a white cloth and shine her flashlight into it. Or sometimes Igor, our DP, had foil on him. And she would have to shine the flashlight into him so it would back, 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 uh, bounce back into her face. So she was ha holding a lot of technical challenges as, as well as her performance. So she, it was really grueling for Lizzie. Questions out there? Yeah. How many takes were there and, and what was the, uh, what was the length of time for the longest How many takes were there in fact and what was the longest take? Well, if, when you're asking how many takes, I'm... I'm uh, I mean, I, how many shots? I would translate that as to how many shots. And it's embarrassing to say I, I, I don't even know exactly. I, don't know I, I, I would guess nine. There's, the movie's probably nine shots. As far as uh, how many takes to get each one of those shots, as Laura just said, we well work our way into the teens. And at the end of each and every day, usually it was that last take that was the take, which as an editor made it easy because it said that's the only that's, that's yeah. the only one we and finally And our longest take it. was about 13 minutes. It's pretty much we took the camera to its maximum edge. Yeah. What, what camera? The, five, the Canon 5D. Yeah. The question is about the um, the Uruguayan film, w which this film is based on. Uh, th this viewer felt this was a much more successful. It, it, it negotiated the the whole thing about the sort of uh, internal reality being externalized much more successfully than the Uruguayan film. And so, could you talk about the way you, Thank were, you. you kind of Thank you. built on um, it? Certainly, we had the benefit of the original, and um, there was a there was a true story that was there was a kernel of a true story there, and the. Um, the actual, the, the original didn't actually f go through with it, which there was an incest angle, and they stayed away from it in the original. They kind of went with a, like a pregnancy abortion thing, and I think for me, in writing the script, I really wanted to understand, the first thing I started with, why would somebody kill their father? Like, why? You know, what, what would happen to you? What would have to happen to you that you would kill somebody? I mean, it's a big thing to kill somebody. And so I actually did a lot of research, and I found that People who are traumatized, especially under the age of 10, and if, unfortunately, it's very, it's horrendous. Um, you know, sexual abuse, any kind of physical abuse can lead to um, all kinds of mental illness, including something like dissociative identity disorder, which is what we worked with here. And what can happen is that, you know, you, you fragment your, your identity in order to protect yourself. So like the little girl is like the essential self, and the Sophia is the part that wants to live, and the, the stalking man is actually a protector. He was, he's both a persecutor and a protector. He's kind of a complicated, but it was based on a, a book actually that I read about um, Jungian archetypal defenses. And so I really wanted to be faithful to what is the actual experience of somebody who is deeply traumatized. And I looked at even studies. There were studies that were done on people in death row. And what they found is that Mo uh, so many of them, it was the first time that they understood this in the 90s, that they were, they were abused as children. They didn't even use it in their defense because they suppressed it and they didn't think, you know, I mean, it's not an excuse for murdering anybody, right? And it was the first time that they realized that, wow, you know, this is really, this is really a, a serious issue. And of course, incest is a very serious and widespread problem. It was very painful reading. You know, actually, I would, I would sob at night reading this stuff. It was really, really painful. And so I wanted to be, I really wanted to be, I didn't want it to be her fault what happened. You know, I really wanted it to be that she doesn't, she herself has suppressed it in order to sort of survive. And being in this house has brought everything back up. And it's like her own unconscious now that is trying to bring this up to, to her consciousness so that she can move on. And of course, you know, I, I was hoping that the film would work on many levels. And, you know, of course, on a psychological level, there's always issues with mother and father and having to kill the father to leave the house. Um, so I was working on a lot of different levels and, um, you know, trying to communicate that.
I think I think it's interesting that we were approached to remake a. It's just you see, the idea of being approached to do a remake was interesting for us, but remake a horror film, then try to find a, an in that that mattered, and I think clearly you can see that. that you know, it was funny because both me and Laura scratched our heads and said, because I was very intrigued by the technical of, of of like, wow, how what a challenge! How do you do a movie that appears to be in in, in one, a single shot? But I could not find an in. I could not find a way or a story, and and. L Laura delved into some <laughs> very dark places and and um, and took it very seriously in places that I actually feared to tread and uh, and 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 did some very serious research and and because her intent was always to make not so much a horror movie but a movie that kind of delved into kind of real horror. So I, I, it was interesting to me is that because it's it's. We're, we're definitely very aware of the fact that we've made a genre film. Um, at, at the same time, we kind of very consciously decide to tackle something that would not be a, a very popular thing to tackle within a genre. And so it wasn't like, it, it, so every decision, there were no d gratuitous decisions through the whole entire course or journey that, that Sarah takes. Every ev image and everything you see is all along the path of, of, of this, this kind of ho real horror. Yeah, and I would say the other thing too is of course, because it was, we knew that it was gonna be a continuous shot, that it actually gave us an opportunity to play with time because it's real time, right? It's like it's one continuous shot and yet that really opened up being able to play with time and memory because her experience as a traumatized person is discontinuous. A person who's traumatized sense of time is discontinuous. And so there are, she's actually experiencing things that happened in the past as though they're happening now. So um, you know, there's all kinds of things happening with her in time that um, I felt that the, the actual, the, having the film be in real time actually made that really interesting for us. Uh, yes. Um, one of the favorite bits of this viewer was uh, when she was using the Polaroids to uh, to um, see what was going on and and what were the, what were uh, what were the challenges in visualizing that part of the film apart from being able to slip a cut or two in. Well, in in all fairness, we we were charged with make, doing a remake, and that was one of the most effective things in the original film. Well, we did do it differently though, because in the in the original it was just black, and I like the idea of just you know I, I don't know if you noticed that, you know you just just like you you're straining to look and you just see these kind of impressionistic kind of like images of things that she's moving, and so it's not actually just pure black. There's some some image in it, and it was challenging actually getting those shots and making them look right. Um, and there was, there was, um, I think, uh, I think, th I think that there was some confusion about actually how to accomplish those th those shots. Well, the confusion was that there was this idea of the purity of the single take, and obviously, uh, yes. when you cut to black, it meant that you were giving the audience a moment to say, "Oh, it's not really a single take," but in we had. You know, Laura and I were on the same page, but we had discussions with uh, the crew and people because it, it, this is not about a technical exercise. This is not about, and when you make any kind of movie, the idea of the movie is to deliver a certain kind of experience to an audience, and who really cares? As it's I all said, about story I delivered and character. it. And so, so it wasn't like we must maintain the integrity of the single take. We must do what makes the scene most effective. And what makes the, most, the scene most effective is to cut to black in these moments and let the audio and the sound drive the viewer's imagination to really bring the horror. And in, in, in my feeling is in, in the films that are most effective, that scare me the most, are the ones that kind of ignite the imagination of the audience to kind of bring it, w w what is there, so. Yes.
She left, I think, yeah, yeah, just geographically, you might have been a little confused. She left that room. She walked out of that room into a different room. And when she walked out the door, what you were seeing was the foyer. And the bodies were in the living room where the fire was. So they, she went into that huge foyer where she had lit the lanterns, and then she went out. Which is completely understandable because our, our kind of design of the film was to create a labyrinth, so to speak. So, so <laughs> it would make sense you'd be confused. Yeah, there were a few times when I felt like they were kind of during the progress of a particular shot or a particular movement that, that effectively she was sort of walking in a circle. So, uh, like, was there a certain amount of kind of geographical cheating of the layout of the house? No, there wasn't. Actually, um, the house was um, a real coup for us because what happened was I had to write the script without a house, and that was not so simple because with no cutting, it really needed to be perfectly on point. And actually, the first draft was like 60 pages, which made everybody very nervous. And we actually had to sign documents saying, this is, we warrant that this is going to time out to feature length. And I honestly didn't know. You know, I mean, I've written a lot of scripts, but I didn't know. I just knew that this, this felt right, but I really didn't know. And then once we got the location, which was not easy to find because of the fact that we knew we were shooting 360, and we knew we were shooting very, very long from room to room, there was no place to hide lights. So we needed to, hi to have high enough ceilings to be able to light from above. And it's not that easy to find a house with this kind of character with high ceilings. Most of the ceilings, and especially in the East Coast here, tend to be low. So we were looking really far out. We were already like two hours out. And we got very lucky. It's a long story. I won't tell it here. But our production designer remembered a house and, and it ended up being in New Rochelle, which is very, very close. But um, this house, so once we got the house, um, we went to the house and basically I rewrote the script taking into consideration this house, which was different from what I had imagined because I had imagined a two-story house, not a three-story house. I had imagined a house not on the water. And, and I'll say the reason she did that was because we, you know, it's a low budget. We didn't really know <laughs> what we were going to get and it would seem safest to, to, you know, Yeah, we never, it was a total mind. bonus that it was on the water. You know, we never, I never dreamed to get a location on the water because that's expensive. Um, and so the budget was, um, Oh. A secret. <laughs> We're not supposed to tell what the budget was. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the Madonna movie? There was also a Madonna score, but Nathan Larson and the use of the cello was quite different than the, the kind of music that you hear in Madonna. Did you hear that, Chris? I, I, I believe that you were... Uh, yeah, I was asking about the music and about sound. And, uh, and the use and of the, the cello, which I, I love that you, you brought that up because it's dear to me. Um, we work with the fantastic composer, Nathan Larson. Yeah, and, um, and we had a lot of discussions going into the film about, I mean, obviously we discussed the films that... Uh, we cared about most in the genre. Obviously, The Shining and Penderecki, I think, and, and Kubrick have left their mark. And they, when, I think once The Shining came out, it kind of changed the way these, these films were scored. Um, and, and so we kind of talked about the use of um, kind of older instruments and things that were not, not so modern and things that are a little bit more organic. But a lot of the conversation was about how to communicate the internal experience of, of Sarah. I mean, so much of this movie and so much of the single take and so much of, uh, I mean, the reason why this this story and, and, and the one shot whole thing were, were so intriguing was that you're getting to experience a film singularly, exclusively through the point of view of, of this one character and discovering things through the point of view of this one character, the external, the way she's experiencing it in the internal, and how we could use not just music but sound, complete because the, the, the sound design and the music are tied together, and and Nathan came up with this these two kind of cello themes that just I I felt just kind of really emotionally struck a certain kind of chord, and they and they also fell within the kind of aesthetic our aesthetic taste of of this kind of you know how how do you get away from the the genre conventions and at the same time I mean there are there are elements that work and so and, and I, it's really Nathan who just kind of came up with this and we were very happy with what he came up with 
Was there, um, when the film begins and she's kind of down at the edge of the water on the rocks, is she already in the the, the dissociative state that, that takes us through the movie or is there a moment between the, that, Im that first image and when things start to happen where it, it takes over? Well, the idea is that she is already, and the, the first clue is when she comes into the house, you know, Peter says, where have you been? You know, I thought you went, to, did you go into town? You know, I was looking for you, and then she said, I had a headache. And a lot of times these episodes are started, they start with a headache. And so there's little clues that things are not okay with her right from the beginning. I mean, hopefully you didn't, you know, you didn't know until you got to the end of the film. But the idea was that, yes, we're already in her reality at that point. I mean, uh, when they discovered the, the hole in the wall and the mold, I thought maybe the mold was somehow a factor in influencing, like maybe a, a, some kind of hallucinogenic kind of thing in the air. I think, you know, uh, Rochelle Berliner was our production designer, and we, we really saw the house as being Sarah. And we really wanted to work with the idea of what it is that's behind the walls that's not seen. And we wanted to, um, you know, we worked with a lot of wallpaper that was like um, plants and birds, and a little bit of a nod to Hitchcock's birds, because he, you know, the, the whole idea of how the, the unconscious comes in and tears things up. Um, and we wanted the house to actually be like the compartments of her mind, which is why we didn't go to the third floor until the, the third act. And um, so I like that, the idea of what is it that's behind the, uh, behind, the, behind the walls, and I like the idea of holes being the wall, and I like the idea of how the father is the first one to put a, a hole in the wall. And she says to Sophia, I have holes up here, you know, I don't remember stuff. Um, and so all these things, you know, are, are planted through the film. Yeah. Yeah, the question was about the, the original movie came out last year and was there a sense of urgency about um, getting this one out? You know, it's interesting theaters. because we did make this film unbelievably fast because what happened was the woman who had the remake rights at Wild Bunch in France uh, for the Uruguayan, they owned the Uruguayan and they wanted the remake to, do, to remake it. She was at Cannes with the original and in May, which is when Can is, and um, she ran into somebody who we know mutually and said, what are those open water people this doing? This was May we like 2010, not 2011, We made it the right? year before, 2010, yeah. yeah. And um, she said, you know, those, what happened to those open water guys, right? Because we haven't made a movie since open water. What happened to those guys? <laughs> uh, you know, what did they do? What did uh, happen to them? What you? happened to them? That's a whole other story. story. Well, I'll tell you that story in a minute. Um, and so uh, we met her in June. She called and said, hey, you know, I have this movie and it's, it's one take. Chris was like, one take? Wow, well, that's really cool. Um, she sent us the DVD and I kind of got it in my head that we could make Sundance. Everyone thought we were insane. In fact, they were gonna take the original to Sundance. And um, I remember going to a meeting with Wild Bunch and they were like, forget it, forget it. We're taking the original to Sundance. Um, there's, there's no way. And I was like, you know what? You guys are wrong. <laughs> You're making a big mistake. <laughs> you know, the, the, we, we, can, we can do this. Um, and what it meant was getting the script written really fast. And I actually pulled all nighters writing the script, which is the first time I pulled all nighters writing since college. You know, I don't remember staying up all night writing <laughs> since college. And then, you know, because of the fact that I think we were working with a French company, they're creatively extremely supportive of filmmakers and they don't have like these committees where they make you go through draft after draft. They were, they were able to move fast. They were like, we love it, let's go, let's go. And we put it together very quickly. We were shooting by October. And because of the fact that you know, we had basically one, maybe two takes after each day that we knew, we only had like one or two usable takes. We pretty much knew what the shot was. We basically did one shot a day, one sequence a day. So post, in, in terms of picture, came together very quickly. And we basically skidded into Sundance, you know, with, um, you know, and, and we actually did some reshooting after Sundance. Um, and we were able at that point to redo some of the sound work because we did make the, the, fir the, the, fir the film very, very quickly. It was like six months. I, I think in answering your, your question about a sense of urgency, it wasn't a matter of sense of urgency. It was a matter of a, a sense of opportunity because we just had really fond memories of Sundance <laughs> and, and it's such a great place and we did not take for granted at all that we would get in. 
but it, it just, it, when you're trying to achieve something, to set a goal is always a good thing, and, um, and we just set that goal, and, and we just kind of kind of move forward. Yeah, and in some ways, we didn't know if we would make it, but we did. So uh, what was this other story about what happened between the first, <laughs> between open water and this one? Oh, you mean those eight years? <laughs> um, eight lost years. You know, it's interesting because um, what, what, what happened along the short of it is I think that after Open Water, which, you know, was a very surprising success to us, in, in, uh, is I think uh, if, if, if you're in Hollywood, you assess and you look at us, was that these guys know how to make movies at a low budget that could be released wide and make money. So what did we do? <laughs> we just kind of like, like a bunch of idiots ignored that and decided we were going to try to make the step up and, and, uh, and, and make a bigger budget movie and work within the studio system. And, and it wasn't even a conscious decision. It was more that something, a, a passion project of mine was dangled in front of us, uh, which was to do the, uh, the film about the sinking of USS Indianapolis. And I don't know if any of you know what that it is or not. Another shark movie. Another shark movie, but it wasn't really another shark movie. It was the shark movie, and the reason I made Open Water was it was a chance to make the Indianapolis story on, on a very, very small, low-budget level that we can control. It's kind of a calling card, and it worked, and, and Warner Brothers hired us to do this film, which is, you know, a $100 million-plus picture, and, and we got... We, we, we got involved in that project and, and things went forward very positively for a long period of time, but I think we got a sense of how movies are made in Hollywood and, and it's, it's very different in the independent I think, world. I think as independent filmmakers, I think that, you know, obviously there's, there's all different kinds of movies and there's all different kinds of filmmakers and we basically, as independent filmmakers, got caught up in the, in the Hollywood system wanting to do our own stuff. If you, if you will take stuff on assignment and you will do stuff that they want you to do, you can work. But if you're trying to do your own stuff, and I think we were naive because Chris and I are both writers, and so we had specs, you know, which is a script that you write on your own that nobody pays you for, and they would buy it, and we'd be like, yay, you know, we're going to make this movie, not realizing that they buy everything, the studios, and they make just a tiny percentage of what they actually buy. So so I think also that you know we really we wanted to do our own thing and we wanted to do it in the studio system and I think that was one thing that made it difficult and I think that the strike happened there was the writer strike which was very difficult and then just the drop in in indie f in filmmaking altogether with the with the drop in the economy so I think there was just a lot of strikes against us. Um, Isn't there an Indianapolis film being made now or about well to come now? Out or something? I mean they've been trying to make an Indianapolis film for thirty years. You know before us there was Barry Levinson and there was. Um, uh, there was a whole lot, of, whole lot of guys in, in line, and we actually got further than anybody else. And then the regime that we were working with is gone at Warner Brothers now, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. is is working on something that's on a much smaller scale, it's a more intimate kind of version of that film. And and God, I, I hope he, I hope he makes it because the the thing that was heartbreaking about the Indianapolis picture not happening, <coughs> and you know I was very proud that we got as far as we did. We got further than anybody else, but was that I befriended so many of the survivors and so many of the families of the people that actually, you know, suffered through this. And these guys are up there in years because it's World War II. And it meant so much to them to see this movie get made. And, and all my friends, all those survivors are, are dead now <coughs> and gone. And that was very, very painful not to be able to deliver on that, that promise. And so the fact that there is a project in the works right now that could be made. I'm, 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 I'm rooting for it. I gotta ask this, but how did those survivors feel about the Robert Shaw speech in Jaws, where he talks about the Indianapolis, and uh, supposedly he was one of the survivors it, of the Indianapolis. That it, it. What's so great is you asked me that, and I asked them that, and all of them said when I asked them that, no one ever asked me that question before, <laughs> and 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 because it seems like an obvious question, you ask, you know, but it wasn't, and, and th they all, two of them that come to mind were just kind of shocked and, and felt a certain kind of recognition of something, because these, these guys, this generation from World War II, they didn't talk about anything, any of the horrors or anything that they suffered, because it wasn't, you don't talk about that stuff. And, and for some, 
the recognition in a public way, they actually they, they felt something of, of meaning. For others, they, they felt like that this was being exposed in this popular film that was just nonsense in, you know, I love the film Jaws, but I'm saying in, in, in context of what, what they suffered were, they had to leave the theater and, and the emotion that came up. Um, so it was interesting, the different responses. But I, I love that you asked that question only because of the response I got when I asked that question from them. Well, it's interesting that they even went to see a movie called Jaws if they were survivors of the Indianapolis. You'd think that would be the last movie they'd want to see. Well, none of them had a, any animosity. None of them had any animosity toward sharks. I, 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 I mean, and in, in, in rightfully so. And you could see why. Because it was really about the U.S. Navy, not the sharks. It was the fact why, why after we just... Uh, delivered, you know, we, we, we were successfully d just completed a, a, an incredibly important mission, a top secret mission that, that the President of the United States sent them on. Why were we forgotten the second that was done? Why did nobody notice that they were gone for five days and no one noticed these men who just did something that changed the course of the war? And, and so that would certainly weigh on their mind, and that their captain was made the scapegoat of that. So the sharks are a small part. I mean, the interesting thing is when the, when Jaws came out, Pauline Kael reviewed it, and she denounced that particular scene. She she said that that was criminal and exploitative, and you know violated the the you know the, the memory of these guys and and what they went through. So it's kind of interesting that they didn't they didn't mind that much. Well, that's what's great. What you just said there is that that was the first. Recognition. That was the first time it was put out there in the public. That that speech that uh, Robert Shaw made was the first awareness, including myself, but of, you know, I was a little kid, but of of anybody. Uh, and I think most of the people that were involved with trying to get this project off the ground. Doug Stanton wrote the book in harm's way that that I, I uh, me and Laura. Um, wrote the script based on, and his first awareness was Jaws. So Jaws was the first time that that story was put out there for everyone to know, and I think they all really appreciated that. Well, I think we kind of looks like I'm getting the... Uh, I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to have to stop. Yeah. Well, in my thinking, this was, this was not one event that happened. And in my thinking, this child tried to run and hide, and she tried to get away from them, and she would be chased and, and caught, and you know these things would happen to her. Um, so that's, that's what I had in mind. And so when she's hiding under the table, and she's hiding, that's, those are actual flashbacks to what she did when she was a child, and she's hearing the running. It's actually her, her remembering what happened to her when she was a child, even though she suppressed it? Um, and you asked about the little, you know, part of what we were kind of playing with with the film was um, we don't want to give away that the ending of the movie right from the beginning. And so we were um, playing with a, a home invasion type of genre. So you mean it was a red herring. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because you could say that. Um, I mean, I, I don't think red herring applies at all. Uh, actually, I think there's a, a real consistency to, uh, you know, the script that you wrote. There, there's, there's, first an exploration of what what this particular situation she, she's undergone is, in, in in trying to be true to that. But at the same time, understanding that you're you're trying to create a uh, a story in a film where an audience has a sense of discovery, and so we're very aware that the first steps of discovery would be that this is, and, and very aware of what the genre is, because we are charged, we are hired. We are hired to make a genre film. And so uh, very aware that first we were going to try to take this on as something that would be perceived as a home invasion film. And maybe that it's would- It's not just that too, though. I mean, the thing with the home invasion angle is that she is being invaded, you know? Yes. So it's like Stalking Man is a home invader. and. And it's the same thing with like little girl maybe being a ghost. There was like some haunted house nod there too, and she she is being haunted. So, 
you know, I was trying to work on different levels with the film and hopefully take you on a ride so that you would stay with it and then not really understand what was going on until the very end of the movie. So it wasn't a red herring, but you had your cake and ate it. <laughs> All right. That's Thanks very much for do. coming out so Thank late, you. guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you.